that your columns are actually taking the moment and the diagonals, which form the bracing, take the shear. So braced frames are actually very similar to truss designs, just slightly different geometry. What's up, YouTube? This video, we're going to be talking about braced frames. We're going to run through what is a braced frame, the different types of braced frames. And by the end of this, you'll know how to calculate it by yourself in under five minutes. So what is a braced frame? It simply is a lateral stability system. One thing to be careful of, when people talk about braced structures, they could be talking about bracing or shear walls, as I've highlighted in the literature here. This video is going to be focusing specifically on bracing as a form of a braced structure. The concept of lateral bracing is very similar to truss design, where the top and bottom cords take your moment and your diagonals take the shear. You can see here, I've just moved the supports over to one side and then rotated the truss uh, onto its vertical side. And it's the exact same concept. Now this time, because those uh, top and bottom cords and now sort of your columns on the left and right hand side with the supports uh, at the base of the columns, it's still the same concept where your columns are actually taking the moment and the diagonals, which form the bracing, take the shear. So braced frames are actually very similar to truss designs, just slightly different geometry, as we'll get to see in an example later. And yeah, I've just got some little notes here in terms of the columns, uh, they're vertical in orientation. If you rotate them on the side and you put the spots on either side, it, it that's what forms a truss. And when you design a truss, you simply, you take the moments, you divide it by the lever arm to get the axial forces in the top and bottom cords of your truss. And then you let the diagonals take the shear. This is exact, exact same. We've just rotated the truss vertically, put the two supports on the ground, and it's sort of like a cantilevering truss. So what is a brace frame? Essentially, as I mentioned before, it's a form of lateral stability system. And how do you create one? All it is, is just putting in this diagonal member in between columns. It's that diagonal member which takes the, the lateral load. You get rid of that diagonal member, you don't have a brace structure. Bracing structures are typically made out of steel. That doesn't mean you can't have concrete um, and timber as uh, your bracing members, but because uh, the bracing members typically need to be able to take both compression and tension, depending on their orientation and the direction of the load, the yeah, its ability to take compression and tension lead itself to steel because steel's obviously you can have steel's pretty good in tension, and we can also have steel members that are good for resisting compression. So if we look at a simple three-story structure like this, where we've got vertical elements being the columns, horizontal elements being the beams, right now we have no bracing, so it's not a brace structure. We add in these diagonals and we've got a brace structure. So let's look at how those uh, loads operate and what type of axial forces the diagonals see depending on the lateral loads that the structure gets. So here we've got some loads going from the left to the right and because those diagonals are sort of pointing um, away from the load, if you will, they're going to be in tension. The way I see it, sort of it's stretching out those members. So because they're all in the, the same orientation, those members are all in tension and you can do sort of a method of joints to um, confirm whether those members are in tension or compression. This is called a strut system because when the load reverses the other way, those members need to be able to detect compression. So that's part of the reason why uh, brace structures lead themselves to steel members because they need to be good in both tension and compression and that's what steel is uh, pretty good for. So here you can see the load going from the left to the right. Now all those members are in compression. So they need to be able to yeah, um, be designed for axial compression as, as well. You can also uh, sort of like step your bracing just sort of diagonally. It doesn't actually have to sort of all look the same. And in this case, your members will be in, um, depending like where they are, both tension and compression. So as you can see here, we got load coming from the, the left-hand side. The top and bottom bays are in tension and that middle bay is in compression. 
Again, you can just do method of joins just to satisfy yourself. All those uh, nodes are in equilibrium. So you can also have cross bracing. Um, what designers tend to do is uh, typically sort of just design the cross bracing as tension only. So they'll, for this example here, the dashed out lines, they'll just ignore any contribution from those diagonal members and just assume that, that it's the tension members resisting that um, the, the lateral load in this structure. Okay, so I've just shared a bunch of different ways you can brace a structure and you're probably thinking why all the different methods and how do I know which one to use? In general, the, the shorter structures will lead themselves to the cross bracing and the taller structures would have the struts that are taking compression. That is because the compression members are stiffer and the taller structures, we don't want them to deflect as much compared to the shorter structures, which is why you'll see, and I'll share a couple of uh, examples, uh, warehouses and sort of like industrial buildings that aren't skyscrapers will have cross bracing and they use angles and that's okay because yeah the taller structures um you know if they sway a little bit because they're less stiff it's less of an issue compared to the taller structures so here is an example you've probably seen yeah and sort of like shorter story industrial warehouses and whatnot the the cross bracing is pretty uh common and in the taller structures the the bracing will be um you'll have some struts in there and the, the struts take compression. So let's run through an example. I've just got a, a plan building here and sometimes it's quite common on drawings to show your uh, bracing as sort of these like crosses. You wanna have some notation on your drawing um, or if you're, you're doing a sketch, you're sitting the iShark D exam. So it's clear to whoever's looking at your sketch or your drawing, <clears throat> what you're showing. But you can see here, we've got a, orthogonal square building and we've got two bays of uh, bracing um, in each of the orthogonal directions just on the perimeter of the building. So our task is to essentially yeah, design this uh, brace structure. So firstly, we have to work out what the, the wind pressure is or the lateral load on our building here. I've got one KPA on a whole elevation. So the next step is to work out what a proportion of that lateral load is going into each of my lateral stability systems or my bracing uh, bays. So the same way you work out tributary areas on columns and beams, it's the, the same when you're looking at plan view onto your lateral stability elements. Here, I'm just saying half of it. Or well, one thing to note is for each direction, it's only the ones in the same plane. So this one KPA in this direction would just be split between the two bracing systems on the sort of like north and south or the top and bottom. And then in the other direction, I've got two lateral stability elements resisting that lateral load. So that one KPA, half of it is gonna go to um, the bracing at the top of my building and the other half on the, the southern elevation. I've got some dimensions here, 10 meters. So one KPA, which is one kilonewton per meter squared times 10 meters, you get 10 kilonewtons per meter. So now I'm, I'm looking in section, or in elevation, sorry. And I've just drawn it as a stick here to um, really simplify like how simple the process is. So we've got 10 kilonewtons on a, a cantilever. Uh, if you remember, let's just say it's 12 meters tall, cantilevers, the bending moments are WL squared on two. WL gives you your total sort of uh, net force on the element and L on two is the where that resultant force acts. So that's how you get the M star equals WL squared on two and the shear is just W times L. So that's our sort of reactions at the base. And if you remember our truss design, how we said earlier how the, the top and bottom cords, et cetera, take the moment and the diagonals take the shear. It's the same with the brace structure. So that moment is resolved by the, the two columns and the shear by my diagonals. Okay, so we worked out we have a moment of 720 kilonewton meters. We simply divide that by the lever arm to get the push pull. 
So in this instance, we got a lever arm of three meters, 720 kilonewton meters divided by three is 240. So that's the axial force in the columns. Uh, the right hand side is in compression, the left hand side in tension. So now we know that's a that's the critical uh, um, axial force from that moment within the the columns, and now we just need to work out what the diagonal is taking in shear. So we do that by just uh, equations of equilibrium. We take a cut. We know what the shear force is from our previous when we worked out the reactions of our cantilever. That was 120 kilonewtons. Um, so yeah, if we just solve F times, is it cos 45 equals 120? If we just assume that angle is 45 degrees, you should be able to work this out based on some basic trigonometry, but I've just said, okay, it, it goes up 45 degrees. And that means when you solve for F, you get 120 kilon, sorry, 170 kilonewtons in uh, the diagonal. So now, that diagonal there is in uh, tension as well. You actually probably, um, the steel elements are gonna be more critical in compression because they're subject to, to buckling based on their effective lengths uh, compared with members in tension. So this is just for uh, illustration purposes, but what would be more critical the, is to check that member when the load's going the other way. So this is essentially, um, the load coming down through your brace structure, I'm here just identifying, not very clearly to be honest, the, the tension and compression in each of the members. We've identified that column there, the max axial load is 240 kilonewtons compression, and that's the most critical element. If we just had the same members through that whole braced, uh, that braced bay, that is the most critical element because it's the the highest axial force and it's in compression the the opposite column is in tension so we know that it's it's not going to be more critical than the element in compression because compression is subject to buckling um, the same with the diagonal which is also in tension and had a small axial force so now we know the axial force, the critical axial force in all of the members of our brace structure. It's time to choose a member. I'm a big fan of using uh, closed sections for brace structures because they've got good uh, axial capacities in compression. Um, the, the closed sections, uh, yeah, they have, they're less resistant to buckling. So they lead themselves quite nice to brace structures and these steel capacity tables are pretty easy um, you identify or calculate your effective length and then you choose a uh, a member based on the axial force that we calculated from our hand calc so that's exactly what i've done here i've just gone open up my uh, steel capacity tables for a uh, shs uh, member what have we got here it's a hundred by three SHS that I think I've chosen here to take the, the, the compression load. And I just use, in this instance, I use the same member everywhere, which is why I can say um, this is fine. I've found the, the critical part of my brace structure and I know that it's okay here. So I know it's okay everywhere else. So that's it. That's how I've designed brace structures. If you want to further brush up, these are the two sort of um, guides that I found quite handy. There's a nice shock D guide, which just talks about sort of, uh, yeah, uh, braced frames and the steel capacity tables if you're looking at uh, steel capacities of closed steel sections. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe.